Science sure. has proven that the human embryo is physically alive. Okay, this is a question that comes from Maria. Mm -hmm. We know that a child's heart can mm -hmm. be seen circulating blood in about 22 days after conception. Scientifically and mm -hmm. soundly, how else can we argue that life begins at conception? Thank you. So we, we have certainly now yeah, with I, ultrasound I, I, and things, we can mm -hmm. see a lot of things we couldn't see and hear before. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think there is even a question that uh, scientifically, um, uh, Maria, that um, uh, scientifically that a, a full human being is present at conception. We know from DNA sequencing, this goes all the way back, you know, to, to about 1978, <clears throat> You know that the full human genome is there. Uh, Jerome Lejeune uh, testified to this in uh, two appellate court decisions. You know, it's unquestionable that the mitochondrial DNA is present. It's unquestionable that this uh, you know cell is metabolizing mm -hmm. and living. Uh, if you allow that cell to live with its full human genome already present, then uh, it is unquestionable that it is a full human unique human and only human being, living human being. No one can deny this. Now the problem came in with specious argumentation from the Supreme Court's majority in Roe v. Wade, where they made a specious distinction between human beings and persons. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, go back to uh, the reasoning there in 19b where they, the court says, uh, the majority says, that uh, the appellate's case would collapse uh, if um, a human personhood could be, um, uh, could be established and in fact uh, the appellant has, uh, and, and her lawyers so, uh, have so much as agreed mm -hmm. uh, to this fact. Then, uh, you know, stunningly, the court makes this distinction and says, well, we can't establish the personhood of this full human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> this is the most specious distinction, right? So in other words, we know there's mitochondrial DNA present. We know there's a full and unique human genome present. We know that it is a living organism, which if allowed to live, will continue to develop into a full human being. We know all of this. Suddenly, the court says we can't establish personhood, which means that uh, the, the fetus is deserving of protection mm -hmm. under the law. Okay. Now, of course, the, the court you know, <clears throat> does this in two remarkable, uh, remarkably specious ways. First of all, <clears throat> you know, prior to the court's remarkable decision, the only time we ever see this kind of argumentation is in the Dred Scott decision, mm -hmm. which permits slavery. But what is the whole argument? Mm -hmm. The argument is an argument from silence. The court says, look, the reason we're so uncertain is because we've looked at the language of the 14th Amendment and we failed to find that prenatal personhood is established. Okay, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that the, con the 14th Amendment in the Constitution is silent on the personhood of prenatal living human beings with a unique full human genome. That's what they're saying is it's silent. Now there's a, a, a real important uh, dictum in the law that silence means silence, mm -hmm. that you cannot construe silence to mean the affirmative mm -hmm. or the negative because silence says nothing. Mm -hmm. So it is unfair and it is unjust to ever interpret silence as meaning one or the other. This is a well-known dictum. The court abrogates it, immediately says, because we found no specific mention of uh, uh, prenatal personhood here in the 14th Amendment, therefore it doesn't exist and it's okay to kill that fetus mm -hmm. because we didn't find any evidence 
to uh, to support prenatal personhood. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, that is a you know an egregious violation of logic and of legal reasoning 101. But then the court, you know, when you analyze what they have done, they have completely reversed the entire logic of our constitutional system. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying that the burden is on the courts to prove that a living human being is not a person, <clears throat> in other words, to give evidence that this living, full, unique human being is not a person simply because they are uh, in the womb, in utero, the court suddenly says, no, the burden of proof for us is to establish that the uh, a full living human being should be considered uh, a, a person. In other words, the, the, the burden of proof <clears throat> is that they have to meet is a much lesser mm -hmm. standard. Now all they have to do is show, um, right, that there's some evidence that um, uh, a full human being should be considered uh, to be a person in the eyes of the law. A much easier standard to meet. Now, if you really look at that, I mean, you could, you know, I could find you a, a, a zillion analogies, but let's take a look at the Dred Scott decision, uh, you know, for just mm -hmm. a second, you know, which, which goes ahead and, and permits slavery of human beings, quote unquote, by the superior race. Unbelievable phrasing, right? And what was the logic there? The court said the same thing. The court said, oh, we've searched the Constitution and we do not see any explicit provision guaranteeing black human beings citizenship mm -hmm. according to the Constitution. The Constitution is silent on this. So Dred Scott, right, the, 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 unan the unanimous uh, 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 justices say, because the Constitution is silent about proving personhood for uh, about proving a citizenship for black human beings therefore they don't have it therefore the the constitution intended to deny citizenship to black human beings then they go on with the same logic it's up to the court not to prove that black people should not be considered human beings in order to avoid the principle of non-maleficence, right? Doing them an right. unjust and unnecessary harm. Instead, they say the court is only responsible for proving that uh, black people should be considered human beings, uh, should be considered persons and, and citizens. Right. And we can't do that right now. So go ahead and enslave them. It's okay. We're the superior race well, anyway. Would you say no, in that course, situation, you, would you say, yeah. Father, in that situation that in both yeah. those cases, decisions were driven more by the politics of the day than you know, what the appropriate absolutely. legal decision should have been, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in other words, the abrogations of logic, the abrogation of the principle of non-maleficence, and the bur shifting of the burden of proof from, you know, a, a person is, as it were, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Now, uh, every fetus is considered not a human being until proven that it is. They're, in other words, they're guilty until proven innocent. They're, and, and for all intents and purposes, a complete mm -hmm. reversal of the logic that we have within our courts. And the only way you can justify right. it, right? Because it makes no sense logically, makes no sense ethically, makes no sense in terms of the principle of non-maleficence, avoiding unnecessary and unjust harms, makes absolutely no sense in terms of the burden of proof that we've always established for ourselves that we always should be responsible for proving non person that that, uh, that uh, a human being does not have uh, and is not a person or a citizen not that they have to be shown to be one right that that you you mm -hmm. prove you assume guilt before innocence right the the fact is it, it, it what motivation could you have for right. such specious unethical argumentation right. there's only one reason politics convenience, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. It's a Machiavellian decision mm -hmm. made, I, I shouldn't say this, by some Machiavellian weasels who really <laughs> okay. did not want to honor mm -hmm. the, the, the true intention 
not only of the founding fathers, but of all the people that go all the way back to Francisco Suarez and, and go back to, you know, Hugo Grotius and go back to John Locke and go back to Thomas Jefferson. I mean, you know, when you look at this, they would be appalled at the complete abrogation of natural rights. They would be completely appalled by interpreting silence to mean an absence of rights. They'd be completely mm -hmm. appalled at establishing the burden of proof of showing that, that somebody should be considered a person who's a full human being rather than not a person, right. et cetera. They would be completely appalled. And, and the Supreme Court has gotten away with it because it was politically expedient. It, it, it's a horrible decision. Right. And the precedent that it has established, you can see it's getting multiplied. I mean, it, this is the kind of precedent being used in active euthanasia and so forth, but I don't want to get off on another subject. Right. But it was certainly, this We're, is the kind of logic that well, justified slavery, right. not surprising, it's exactly. justifying and, and the euthanasia.